Mike Butler. I am the uh, past president at Providence Health System. I uh, was there 22 years and uh, retired a few years ago, and today work uh, with some really interesting companies, one of which is Adaptix. And today we're here to talk about Moneyball for Medicine uh, and how Seattle Children's Hospital used the self-service EHR to really empower clinicians, drive efficiencies, and dramatically increase revenue. And uh, it's an honor to uh, be joined today uh, by Zafar Chardre, the Chief Digital Officer and Chief Information Officer at Seattle Children's, and then Dan Lowe, who is a pediatric an anesthesiologist uh, and the co-founder and CMO at Adaptix. With that, I'll turn it over to Zopper to give a little introduction uh, introduction himself, and then to Dan, and then we'll jump on in. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you today on this uh, video broadcast. Um, I'm Zafar Chowdhury. I've been at Seattle Children's running the IT shop here for almost six years, and we do everything from infrastructure to digital to this this particular conversation around analytics. And uh, done a lot of work in the analytics space. We're in stage seven for EMR as well as analytics. Over to Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Zappa. Thank you, Mike. And uh, welcome to the webinar, everybody. My name is Dan Lowe. I am the Chief Medical Officer at Adaptex. I also am a practicing pediatric anesthesiologist at Seattle Children's. Uh, I've been with uh, practicing now for about 25 years. The last 12 have been at Seattle Children's. It's been probably the best 12 years of my life so far. Um, delighted to uh, jump on with uh, today and kind of share some of the stories and share some of uh, the success of what we've been able to do with uh, all the IT infrastructure that Zaffa and his team have built over the years, and more recently when we incorporated Adaptix into our clinical workflows and operational workflows. So yeah, um, uh, as I uh, welcome everybody and uh, back to you, Mike. Yeah, great. Well, it's uh, always great to be working with two physicians. Um, when I spent my 20 years at Providence, I think one of the greatest joys I had in helping build that organization to serve many, many more people was working directly with um, physicians, uh, all who you know have an incredible ability to listen and a same sense of curiosity and do amazing things. And so, Zafra, let's start with you. Um, you obviously took a bold step in democratizing the EMR at, at Seattle Children's. Can you briefly explain why and how you did it and, and what you hope to accomplish uh, in doing that? Yeah, so, you know, data, most healthcare organizations are overflowing with data. The challenge is, is how are you going to enable an organization to look at that data, irrespective of their technical know-how, and then to work comfortably with that data to feel confident about using it and making informed decisions. So that was sort of the premise of where we started, and we... We did that in twofold. We, we put in a replacement of our EMR of the pandemic. And over the years, we've built an enterprise data warehouse. But it's all about, you know, how do we enable clinicians to take a look at their data views in real time and then see the trends of how they're practicing medicine, how it's affecting their teams, what the workflows look like, and of course, the, the drama that's healthcare these days, how do you do more with less? How do you drive more time through ORs? How do you self-serve that data? So we sort of did the building blocks, which was build out the EMR, consolidate the data into an enterprise data warehouse. And then on top of that is the tool called Adaptex. Great, yeah, I mean, uh... Um, I'll just push a couple of uh, images to su support that story. So we have the EMRs app, as you said. Uh, we moved from this kind of system uh, where you have this federated system of how to get data, and then more recently, uh, just to streamline that and accelerate that uh, many folds, we, we, we arrive here at Adaptus, where we have this kind of self-serve management uh, solution uh, made available to all our clinicians. and. That's what we're really here to talk about today as like, how is that being used? And this is on top of many years work that Zafra and his team have done previously. Uh, and we, really it's like, so where are we as an organization and what kind of work have we been doing? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think- Yeah, you know what's, oh, go ahead. what's sort of important to note here is when, you, when you're dealing with data and you're talking to clinical staff, right? The same questions come up. I don't have access to the data I need, for example. I can't mm -hmm. trust the data, 
right? The analytics tools don't make it easy for me to take a look at what I'm doing on a daily basis. And so that was some of the feedback we had through this process, right, right Dan? Yes, um, and that was the problem we we're trying to solve. Um, the, the, the data is stale, the data is old. You're telling me something that happened nine months ago. I want to know as a practicing clinician, what happened to the patients I took care of yesterday? How do they compare to the patients uh, from, you know, uh, how do they compare to the last thousands of that type we've taken care of? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are we providing equitable care? Are we providing, you know, uh, environmentally sustainable care? Like, like there's so many facets to this. And, we, and the, trying to drive looking at the rear view mirror from something that happened six or nine months ago doesn't quite cut it. Being able to see what the choices I made today, how do they affect our system? Am I helping this? Are we as clinicians helping the system or hurting the system? So that's kind of, but that's ex exciting where the technology has taken us. It's taken us right full form to uh, let me just push this guy. Uh, the ability to be able to monitor and evaluate our outcomes and our processes of care in pretty much near real time uh, as, as, as the game changer. So this kind of circle, if you can monitor and evaluate, you can also learn. Um, so. You know, Zephyr, you and I have chatted about this, you know, healthcare takes years to implement things they know. So even when they know to do something, actually doing that something is years. Now, now we've seen this move in weeks and months sometimes. So, uh, it's really massively accelerated. Yeah, you know, what's really so interesting to me about this is, you know, while I was at Providence, um, we stood up really at the time, I think one of the largest single instances of, of EPIC. Um, you know, in the U.S., and we were very diligent, very disciplined about assuring that you know we didn't do a lot of customization. We truly had, um, you know, one instance. The challenge we had was then, you know, how do we, as you, who have you described, put information in the hands of our physicians and, and caregivers to be able to do things real time? And for us, mm -hmm. it became a real challenge because you either focused on a service line. Um, you know, you, you focus on do we build a back end tool that we then provide data to the doctors uh, and how we make things work. And, and what I've really found interesting about learning a bit about, you know, what you've done at Seattle Children's, what you're doing with Adaptix, um, is you are making it real time in the hands of the physician to be able to make changes. And what's super interesting about it is, you know, it's not just about, you know, a single service line, it's really about every pillar of the strategic plan that every organization has you've been able to build a solution to put in the hands of the doctors, you know, whether it's around caregiver engagement, uh, provider burnout, um, you know, capacity in the OR, you know, anesthesia gases in the environment, you know, diversity in the emergency room and how people are taken care of. And so I thought it would be awesome is, um, if the two of you could share a bit about some of the, the case studies you've built that truly fill out, you know, every strategic pillar of a health system strategic plan, which makes it super awesome to engage your doctors in that. So maybe um, turn over to you, Dan, and, to, and Chaudhary, if you are uh, is offered to jump into some of the case studies. Sure, I, I, I can I can take this up. Um, maybe I could share just a couple of uh, touching, the, that's a, such a broad spectrum that you mentioned there, um, from operational efficiency to clinical effectiveness, and you know, if it, um, you know everyone's more capacity. Um, and uh, I, I have a couple of stories to share from CL Children's. Um, the first one um, was uh, is the, you know, was from the GI endoscopy lab. And just to set the context for our audience, um, we have a very very busy GI endoscopy lab. Um, it's probably um, one of the busiest uh, clinical areas in our hospital. Um, takes care of thousands of sedated endoscopies, uh, mainly kind of upper and lower endoscopies for, um, you know, um, as I say, probably 1,500 patients a year. And they were, from this previous slide, you could see there were, this room was running about 30 minutes late per patient. And this story was really how the frontline teams were able to actually solve their own problem. So we, we don't like work running 30 minutes late because over six or seven patients, we finished the day two hours behind schedule. And in a very, very short space of time, they were able to learn from their data, learn best practices from within their group. And this is a story about how they did that. Um, so um, I apologize, some of the videos aren't working on, this, uh, on, the, on the presentation platform this morning. This is actually just a screenshot of uh, just the interface. But really the, the nuts and bolts is a frontline leader was able to get to this. This is a very uh, uh, 
dense slide, but what they figured out was, you know, the, the, the GI lab is running about 24, 25 minutes late per patient. So, which accounts for the two hour late finish each day, huge overtime, huge overspends and great, you know, staff dissatisfaction. So much so that six staff and including the chief resigned over it. So um, this is, um, you know, this is where we pick up the story. Um, they're in crisis mode. If they lost one more staff member, they were actually thinking about shutting down the lab. They couldn't run the lab. So here they said, look, we're running 24 minutes late. This plot here surfaced by the, the leader was all, all, the, all the doctors who, who worked there. It happened to be the anesthesia staff. Each, each point represents one of the doctors. And they said, look, there, there's, a, there's Dr. Grigg here who's an outlier. And said, well, why, is it, why is it possible that one doctor, when they're on service, the room runs precisely on time? So this is, the, this is where the inspiration for Moneyball for medicine comes in. They found the one outlier who, when they was played on the team, the team consistently won. So, you know, in medicine, uh, there's so much variability. We don't work with each other. Everyone does something slightly different. But here, the software was able, the solution was able to pick out the one person who made the room run on time. The second thing she did was, okay, the, the, they figured out what he did and they started to uh, make that the system. Let's not make his workflow a unique workflow. Let's make that the system. The second thing she did, she says, look at our recovery times. This is now a patient outcome. Our recovery times, uh, and I apologize, the print's very small, is about 76 minutes for a day case endoscopy. And, she's, and the director noticed, she goes, why is it that with some people it's 50 minutes and some people it's 60, 70, 80, 100? Why is there a 2x variance in the same procedure, sometimes in the same patient, because these are frequent flyer patients. These are patients who come for surveillance endoscopies every three to six months, some, some of them. So why, why is it fair on our patients and our staff that we have a, a 2x variation um, on, on such a simple outcome? So they figured out, this is actually uh, Dr. Collins. They said, Dr. Collins, you have the best technique, the best combination of drugs, the best, whatever you're doing, they made that a macro in the EMR the next day. So, you know, so Zafra and I have chatted about this. It's like the whole point of the EMR is to leverage it, like learn from the data. And once you learn it and you learn what the best thing, can you now leverage the EMR to drive that behavior? And that's what they did. They made a macro and for one of a, you know, or, a, you know, the audience might think of it as a standard order set. Please do these three drugs in this order. Over the next six months, something remarkable happened. Now, it's not only can you drive that behavior, are you doing it? What is the outcome? And that's what makes it sticky. You can see that the recovery times improved by 30%. Now the patients are going home in 50 minutes rather than almost 76 minutes. Now you can see that the, the room is running ahead of schedule. So this is running five minutes ahead of schedule per patient rather than 24, 25 minutes late per patient. And the, the real nuts and bolts of this is how did you how did the how did the hospital how there's 76 doctors here how did you change their behavior well uh, and I, I like thinking about this as kind of like instantaneous feedback it's like riding peloton if you don't give me the score at the end of the ride the bike the, the, ex, the, the peloton ride isn't as fun here you can see that there's uh, dr brown her first 13 patients took 87 minutes to wake up we didn't she didn't know that before there's no way of surfacing that outcome. But, and she couldn't see where she was relative to everybody else. Now there's a protocol to follow that the team's encouraging um, to, to encourage to follow. She can see over the next few months and weeks, her, her next 39 patients, there's a 30% improvement. So now you're tying a behavior, uh, a clinical behavior. I'm gonna follow that clinical guideline and I can see that the patients get better. So you're tying a behavior to an outcome very, very dynamically leveraging that EMR data that you're already collecting. And so that, that's amazing. And, and the, the, out, um, the outcome of that, if you can see on the, on the image, the room doesn't finish at seven o'clock anymore. It finishes at four o'clock or two o'clock. So to this day, I'm very proud to say they've managed to add two or three extra cases to the schedule and still run the room on time. That's, that's a huge opportunity. It's, you know, depending on your system, that could be worth between five and $6 million in terms of re revenue from those extra, uh, extra capacity that was realized. Um, 
I want to just go sideways into the operating room. Mike, you, you mentioned the OR, um, and you know every OR <laughs> has now been equipped, um, thanks to our IT team, with lots of computers. Like There are literally four computers that capture the process of care. Um, <clears throat> I did have a, a short clip to show you a little bit of the OR, uh, but as I say, the, um, I, I can't, uh, unfortunately, I can't show that. What I wanted to show you was how long it took from uh, anesthesia being ready until the surgeon puts her knife in. And that was hard to get, but you know, we, we have this EMR, uh, we have EPIC, um, in pr prior we had Surgeonet and Cerner, and in both those EMRs, that data was being collected. <clears throat> and this is a story about Paul McGrain, who's the, the chief of urology. He, he wanted to increase the number of cases that they could do in daytime hours for urology, for a service line. And he said, I don't want to make the surgeons cut faster, but I really want to make the time before surgery, so before the knife symbol and after the knife symbol, so after surgery finishes, more uh, efficient. So let's measure that time. And he was able to look at it and say, in his team, this is about 14 minutes work to, uh, to prepare the patient for surgery. And then the next question, again, going back to the money ball analogy, was, <clears throat> is there anyone in my group Who's doing something special and here he's got you know you can see about 10 10 10 surgeons underneath him he's got two surgeons who can do the work in 30 percent less time and so what he did was rather uh, uh inspirational and, and i think inspirational is the word i'll use he interviewed these two surgeons and he said what is it that you do that enables you to do that work in 30 percent less time and the first thing he did he put up his own data this is, the, this is uh, the chief's own data in front of, you know, publicly in front of his group and said, I used to be the 16 minute guy and now I'm the, the 10 minute guy. I actually learned from the two best people in my department how to do that work. And so credit to him that he actually put himself out there. Now his team respond in kind, his team also improved by four minutes. Now the audience might be thinking, well, it's just four minutes. What is four minutes of an OR worth and the answer is um, a lot. If you do nine cases a day and you systematically shave four minutes off, they went from doing 70, seven zero cases to 94 cases a month. So that's 24 extra cases, 24 patients who don't have to wait for surgery, 24 cases that hit your, your revenue. I'm, I'm gonna kind of uh, um, just take a breather there and, and maybe just, <clears throat> just pivot. And because, uh, so when th this was the early work that got us started. And then Zephyr challenged us and said, well, can you, can you do it more? Like, they're, they're two leaders who just did it in their areas. How can you bring these tools to bear for the entire surgery suite? And so the, the team led by a, 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 a periop leadership team said, well, let's try it in general surgery and ODO and, and let's expand it to even interventional radiology. And we, we saw this work. Even in IR, where you have, you know, 30% of the patients come from the ICU, we saw a 37% increase in daytime volume in, in the first 12 weeks of the year. So in incredibly powerful tools. Um, and, you know, that can be scaled across the hospital system. Yeah, and I think um, it's, it's also interesting is a variation in clinical practice exists. How do you actually help clinicians understand that variation? and then try and normalize it, which is what the tool does. And for those, those in the audience that are wondering, well, you know, how did you all, how did, how did all this technically work, right? So of course, you have to have an EMR, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, have to have a data source. The way we set this up is we took the data source that we had, which was Epic. We fed that data source into an I uh, apologize. It seems like uh, we've just lost Dr. Chowdhury. Uh, um, okay. Um, 
I think I, I was following him and see if we can get back online. He was explaining how Seattle Children set this up. You know, the data source was from Epic. Uh, it was fed into an enterprise data warehouse. Traditionally, that data warehouse was only accessible by a very skilled uh, data analysts. And, you know, no hospital has enough of those folks. And so the ability of clinicians and clinical leaders and operational leaders to access that data was essentially gated by the fact that we only have a limited number of these specialized you know, data analysts uh, who, can, who know how to access the warehouse. So the next step was to you know, democratize that data. And that's where Adaptix uh, came into the story because this was a, now a solution that any, all, all the charts that you, you, I just flashed up in front of you, they, they weren't created by data analysts. Sure, the data, the infrastructure was supported by the IT. Oh, Zafra, are you back? Zafa, did you come back on? We we lost you for a little bit. Yeah, I don't think he's back on. Oh, okay. Um, I can see. All right. Yeah. You know, one thing I one thing I wanted to add. Um, obviously, this has been a, a great um, set of stories around improvement in GI, improvement in neurology, adding OR minutes, improving patient access, et cetera. One of the things that I found super interesting about what Adaptix has done was I had an opportunity to meet with the the nursing team and the technology team. And what was interesting, they track when the system the Adaptix is actually being used by physicians to actually build out these bots, you know, as Dan has gone through. And what was interesting was the question they had from, to me was like, well, why do you think this is happening in, in the evening uh, routinely with a lot of our physicians that are leading this change? <laughs> and what was ironic about it was when they were done completing their charting on Epic, they were going to Adaptix to come up with these ideas and build out these potential solutions that they could then share back, you know, with uh, members of, you know, whether it's the, the head of surgery within general surgery, the general surgeons, et cetera, some examples that Dan walked through. So I think the really important point here is these are all driving value to the hospital, all driving value to caregivers and providers, but, but it is physician driven. Uh, and that's why I think they're seeing such great sustainable results. I know that was something that was a challenge for us to do at Providence because we didn't have a tool, you know, like this. We were more more using the kind of old school model of having, you know, analytic groups that provided information to doctors that wasn't real time. Yeah, um, the, the, I think m many hospitals, if not all of them, struggle. Um, they, every hospital system I've ever talked to wants to improve their system. And one of the top questions, is, and certainly in the top three, is how do we... Um, how do we engage our clinicians? How do we engage our physicians? And this is, uh, this, this is part of it um, and a very powerful piece. As Mike said, when we track our, uh, like who's using the system and when, there's a peak usage between 6 p.m. and midnight. That is not the evening shift coming on going, I'm curious about the data. That is people going off shift, finishing their dinner and choosing to be curious about their work and choosing to go, oh, I want to manage something better in my hospital um, and being able to access that data to do that. Um, and yeah, um, one of the questions that came up in the chat is what data source did, did they feed Epic into? The, da the data was principally the EMR data and that's being fed into Adaptix, which is the solution you're seeing right in front of you. Um, Zafra, are you, are you back on sound now? Yes, I can't. can you hear me? I apologize. Yes. yes. No, no, you, you uh, in the in, in describing the technology, and then of course, as a technologist, I turned it on and off again, which is you know the easiest quick fix. So, so I was talking about the fees, right? So for those folks on the call who want to understand how this technology works, you've got to have an, a data feed, whether it's from an EMR or any other clinical system. We then centralize that in an enterprise data warehouse, which happened to be the IBM Natiza, and that's refreshed every night. So we refresh the data every night. And from, from the Nateza platform is where we take all of our data feeds and connect them to the tool Adaptex. So Adaptex actually runs in the cloud on AWS. So the trick here is if you have the data feeds available and the data is validated, because you've got to validate the data from wherever source, whatever source you're using, then connecting it through an API to Adaptex is reasonably quick. And We've sort of used an agile approach to add modules because within the system, there are multiple pre-built modules. Because we want to make this really simple and self-service. And so if you've got the API feed, 
you can connect it to Adapt Dex. And we did it module by module. And so we've been rolling out the modules over a period of time. And as soon as we roll that out, it's available to physicians through a browser. So there's a login and a browser, and you can single sign on into it. And then you can slice the data based on who you are, how you are. And that's been done clinically. From my perspective, my interest in, in having this data is purely around equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? So the question I had was, can we actually tell if there's a variation in how we treat our kids of color, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And what are those outcomes by race, by demographic, um, sex, et cetera? So the tool allows that too. So me as a physician locked in, I can absolutely see the types of patient I have, how quickly do I give that patient pain medication post a surgical procedure, for example, and mm -hmm. I can then slice that by age, by race, by uh, sex. And it was some really interesting stuff came out from just looking at that data. Um, I think that was really an eye opener for some to say, well, Actually, there is some variation, and and Dan, you know, you saw that right in the tonsillectomy yes. scenario that you might want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a great thread to pick up on. And actually, it coincides with Annie Donnelly from uh, the audience. She asked the question, uh, "How do you compare this program to Slice and Dice?" And used the word "slice," so that's maybe what, what triggered it. Um, well, let's see if we can answer both of those uh, uh, and just kind of talk a little bit about how. Um, the physicians and the and leaders at Children's have been using the data to drive not just quality, um, it, but you know also uh, are we giving equitable outcomes and equitable care across our, 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 our hospital? So here, what we're looking at is probably the the, the most common surgery in um, in Seattle Children's a tonsillectomy. And again, apologize that the the, uh, the text is really small, but the, the big picture is. Uh, what would you care about? Uh, what would a patient or their family care about if they came into children's for a tonsillectomy? They care about how much pain they're in when they wake up. They care about, hey, uh, does are you in severe pain? The nurse has to give you a, a morphine when you wake up. Um, how long do you stay? What is your risk of bleeding? And if we take any of these metrics, that you can see many different colors. And this goes back to that well, adaptive clinical management uh, slide I showed earlier. Each of those different uh, colors represents a different protocol they tried. And these are measured in weeks and months. They're not measured in years. So over the last two years, you can see there's been at least seven protocol changes. And if you look at this chart, you can see, hey, uh, as you change your protocol, uh, it's getting better. In some instances, a lot better. The, 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 the chart I'm hovering my mouse over is looking at uh, you know, essentially a, a, a proxy for severe pain. If you have severe pain, the nurse is going to give you morphine. Um, you went from 27, one in four patients experiencing that effect, to two patients. When is the last time you saw a 14x improvement in anything in healthcare? If you had a 2% or 4% improvement, that's like Hall of Fame numbers, to get a, a 14x change in any outcome, a 20% increase, decrease in length of stay, you know, uh, essentially eliminating uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting, halving your narcotic uh, prescription by your surgeons, uh, eliminating your patients actually calling in or complaining or having concerns about their care. So there's all these things. Now, if you can do that, as Zafa said, is it applied evenly across the board? Does it matter? So what we do, we take the same metrics. And again, this is the same data. If you, are, if you anchor your eyeball to the top right of the slide, you saw this thing went from 27 to two. We'd like to go to zero, which is, you know, but, uh, but is it applied equally? Each of these dots represents a race, ethnicity, and language. And what we're trying to do is get everybody dancing on a straight line. If we look at this, this is 30-day return to OR following a tonsillectomy. Three years ago, we had a problem. Somali patients, a Vietnamese patients specifically, uh, um, uh, were having a much higher bleeding rate from a tonsillectomy, necessitating coming back for a second surgery. Now, 
they're dancing on a straight line, right? So as the system improves and your safety improves, hand in hand with that, we have to make sure that there is no equity gap that we're inadvertently contributing to, or more deliberately, can we close the gaps that we recognize? For in this case, Vietnamese children, we, we actually interviewed a whole bunch of Vietnamese families and saying, wow, you know, as part of the you know, like insight, what, why is this happening? We, we think we're doing the same surgical technique. We think we're giving the same drugs. And we interviewed the families. And, they, and what we learned was very, very humbling. Do you remember this, Zafar? The, the family said, your instructions don't make sense to us. Um, it says, written down here and translated, please drink four cups of Gatorade every 12 hours or something. And th th there was confusion amongst some of the families and saying, what is Gatorade? It's not something I can buy at the Asian supermarket. And, and so we changed the language to make it more culturally appropriate. It said, drink four cups of anything. It, it's just fluid and hydration. And as soon as that message dropped, our bleeding rate from Vietnamese patients dropped 3x or 4x overnight to, to, to zip, essentially to zero. Um, so, but it did take someone to ask that question. As Zephyr said, it required uh, the, the clinicians closest to the work to say, hey, we all care about equity, so what are our outcomes? If you can't measure your outcomes of the most common thing you do and able to stratify it by race, ethnicity, language, gender, then it makes it really hard to find or diagnose where the gaps are in your system, let alone fix them. Yeah, and I think to address the question of can you take data from Epic and use their slice and dice of product? Yeah, absolutely, you can do that. But remember, it's still Epic centric. The way we've got this system set up uh, using this tool is this yes, we feed it with Epic data, but we can feed it with any data from any clinical system and it will correlate that data. There are algorithms running in the background that will provide the insight. So if you're one of those health systems that doesn't have a single, what I would call a single version of truth, let's say you've got multiple versions of the truth, you still need to be able to consolidate that. And you could do that in this tool versus with Slice and Dice. So you're just really just looking at epic data. What if you've got you know, historic systems? We, when we move from Cerner to Epic, we archive our Cerner data, but that Cerner data is still available to us, 15 years worth actually, right, Dan? And so you yeah. now have the ability to, to stratify this information across so many years worth of knowledge and then make really informed decisions. So it's, it's quite powerful, right? The reality is showing people how they're practicing and allowing them to make small changes, hey, in IT, we call that agile working, but you know, clinicians don't really understand agile working, but in effect, they're, they're following an agile methodology using this tool. And as Dan articulated, as they make incremental changes, they can quit, pretty much check with fresh data from, from the previous night, whether that has impacted their clinical practice. And mm -hmm. if it hasn't, they can then pivot the next day to try something else while seeing continuous improvement. So it's sort of that that lean, sort of fast acting model of changing the way in which people do their work. And you, you don't have to only feed this tool with clinical data. You can feed it with any system data and then slice that across. So, you know, even IT could do that within this system. Yeah, and that dovetails really nicely with a question that Abigail just asked. She goes, you know, it's, it's, she says, it seems like using process measures is much more actionable for clinicians. Yes, uh, compared to uh, outcomes data pulled from claims. And so, yes, Abigail, what we're, you know, just riffing on what Zaf was saying, we're taking essentially the raw data that the clinicians themselves enter about the patients. And just to tie these two stories in, again, at Seattle Children's, they noticed a couple of years ago um, that black patients uh, specifically were having a much higher rates of um, uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting than some other patients. Uh, uh, and it was linked to the fact that the, there was a discrepancy in how often they received the, a prophylactic medication called Zofran. 
And overnight, they started saying, okay, well, if you know, there's a 20% discrepancy in that drug, uh, let's go fix that. And they were able to fix that very quickly. So they identified an outcome disparity, you know, black patients vomiting more, much more, three times the frequency as they should be. Uh, they, that, that's the process disparity, again, from the raw data. You'd never get this from claims data. This is like, are you getting the drug Zofran, yes or no? And there's a, there's a gap. And so uh, here's the accountability piece. Let's make sure that every patient uh, gets Zofran. So you went from 77% of uh, black patients getting Zofran to 100% overnight. And when you do that, as Zafa said, the important question is, what happens to your outcomes? And overnight, we see that the, the, the post-operative nausea and vomiting rate for black patients drop three and a half times. They go to 1%, just like everybody else. When, so being able to identify treatment gaps, uh, disparity gaps in your system, which is really critical, um, allows you to directly address them head on. And that's really, I'm really proud of the work that we've done. You gotta be brave enough to look. Are you brave enough to look at your processes objectively through a DEI lens like this? And if you are, you can fix them very quickly. But if you don't know there's a problem, it's hard to fix. Now, what happened with the system is when you fix this uh, equity disparity, the system rate went from 2% to 1%. Now, 2% POMB rate is much better than the national average for this procedure. The, the national average is 3 to 6%. And so... At, Seattle Children's could have stopped and said, we're doing great. At 2%, we're doing great. They didn't do that. They actually did the hard work. They did the difficult work, which is, do we have any equity gaps? Can we close them? And in doing that, they improved their system rate by 50% overnight. Yeah, and I also want the audience to understand that we didn't build this so that physicians would be let loose on the data and good luck, right? There's a whole team of analytics people in IT that validated that all the data was correct and clean before it, before it was fed into. So our warehouse is cleansed before data is fed into the ancillary system. And the physicians still have access to actual business analysts who can help them if they still don't understand the data or if they need some basic training on the tool. I find the tool to be pretty easy to use, but of course, you know, variability exists and we can train the physicians on how to use the tool for themselves. So there is a whole support layer associated with this work. It's not just, hey, good luck and, and you know, we're not going to support that. So I just want people to know that it is a strategic approach we're using at Children's in partnership between analytics and end user clinicians to get to what people have been demanding for a really long time. Can I see my data? Can I slice my data? Can I use my data to do good, right? That's really why we're in the business of healthcare. I want to just do good, but how do you help people do good? And so that's why I think the tool has helped our clinicians. And I'm looking at this from the outside being, you know, with my IT hat on to say, does this, has this won us friends with our clinical colleagues? Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, would you match that to patient outcomes, patient experience? Absolutely, right? If you've got patients who are not vomiting post-surgery and that number's gone up, then your patient experience numbers will go up and therefore people will say good things about your facility that you really are doing the right thing. So I think those are all interconnected. It's not just a single approach, it's multiple people working together to get to this outcome. And the goal is to continue to innovate with the data that we have to then increase the throughput. You know, one of the things in the Pacific Northwest is where the really only tertiary pediatric health facility and we need to really get patients through our system so they're not waiting. Hey, this is Mike. Just, you know, one thing I wanted to add before we shift gears a little bit, you've heard about some incredible clinical uses, both from an efficiency, a, a diversity, a health equity perspective, et cetera. Um, you know, also note that the adaptics is not just in Seattle Children's. Um, at one great example is a three hospital system where the, the physician leader of the ER group that had all three contracts took a look at um, door to TPA 
and identified significant differences between black patients and white patients, mm -hmm. um, where it became a number one priority and they were able to, to uh, fix that and move forward uh, and really improve as a result of that. So this insane sense of curiosity of having physician leaders have access to this kind of data drives the kind of courage that Dan talked about to make real change that's sustainable. Um, with that, why don't we shift gears a little bit um, and Zafra, maybe share with the group, um, you know, Seattle Children's has a, a goal of being carbon neutral by 2025 and, and how Adaptix and the work you did uh, together played into that. Yeah, so definitely ask Dan to chime in here, but yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you have data and there are gases used in the OR that put people to sleep. Unfortunately, some of those gases are not friendly to the environment, right, Dan? Yeah. Um, so this was uh, the, the, this was kind of news to me. Even though I've been an anesthesiologist for 25 years, <laughs> it was only a few years ago this really became raised to you know the level of awareness. And you know this is a bottle of one of the gases that we use uh, in the OR to keep people asleep. Uh, you can burn through a bottle of that in a couple of hours. I did not realize, and many of my anesthesia colleagues did not realize that burning one bottle of this, it's like 250 mils, so like a, a, a soda can, right? Um, that, it turns into a gas at room temperature. That is like burning half a ton of coal. That is the carbon footprint. So when you look at sustainability in an organization, think of it as a pie chart. What are the big areas? Well, the big one is transport, people driving to work. Okay, you can't do much about that unless you encourage people to live close or not drive to work. The second one is from the gas furnaces for heating the hospital and uh, also for you know sterilizing units. And then the next biggest one, and it's the only clinical area, is actually specifically anesthesia gases from the OR. That is your next biggest slice of the pie. And what uh, Seattle Children's did with it was absolutely uh, stunning. What they they were able they've achieved a ten x reduction so what you're looking at is the amount of co2 produced per minute per case there's over 30 about you know 25 30 000 cases done a year uh, at cl children's uh, they were producing half a kilogram of co2 per minute per case it's now at 0 0.05 that is a 10x reduction what uh, now that has uh, economic uh, repercussions. The immediate one is the hospital spending about $180,000 less on on, uh, on superfluorine and desflurane. The second one is the hospital can now actually they they not only sign the, the climate pledge uh, from the Biden administration, um, they actually can now document we are now emitting 500,000 kilograms uh, less CO2 from the ORs a year. That represents the about 7% of the entire hospital footprint. And this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be a hot news. Uh, is, uh, you know, the Joint Commission is actually considering putting restrictions on hospitals and managing their CO2 emissions with, uh, you know, with sticks and carrots. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But that's coming down the pipe, just like for every other industry, they are accountable for their sustainability practices and their greenhouse gas emissions. Healthcare has had a carve out, but that is coming to an end much sooner than, than, than uh, people realize. And so being able to get ahead of this, so providing great care, great outcomes. Um, and the way they did it uh, is exactly what I showed you already. This is the same data showing that 10X reduction, but they're showing individual physicians. Physician B didn't know how bad his practices were. When they found out that they were the worst in the group, they got better, and now they're in the middle of the pack, and now they're, they're all line dancing around a much smaller uh, type of less variation. Physician A uh, is a more senior uh, physician who uh, uh, doesn't believe in climate change, and so wasn't wasn't using his wasn't practicing very sustainably. So he's an outlier, and still is an outlier, and remains an outlier. But even though a, a, rising, so a rising tide lifts all boats, so even though you have a naysayer, if you look at position A, and I've moved my mouse back to here from a couple of years ago, position A would have been the best person just a couple of years ago. So that's how far we've moved the needle. And so this, you have to be able to tie, if you want people to change their practice, whether to make it better care, more equitable care, more env environmentally sustainable care, you have to show them 
their outcomes and they have to own their individual outcomes in order to own the group outcome in order to move the needle for the hospital. Um, uh, I'm going to just end with one slide because I did promise uh, full credit, Dr. Elizabeth Hansen. Look her up on LinkedIn. Uh, please scan this. Um, we have about a dozen hospitals uh, from all over the nation joining and replicating this work. Uh, and so, and that, that they're still recruiting for wave two. We want the next dozen or so. So if anyone's interested, uh, please get in touch and you can just scan that QR code and we'll get in touch. Great, thank you, Dan. Yeah, there's even uh, a children's hospital in Australia and one in uh, British Columbia as well that are adopting the technology in, in Project Spruce. So um, why don't we go ahead and wrap up? And Doctor, um, you know, ultimately this was your vision many years ago to pull this together and create what, what we have today in terms of adaptive and its partnership with the uh, health system. Um, maybe just kind of summarize your final thoughts and then we'll jump into Q&A. Yeah, so I think, you know, anybody embarking on a project of this magnitude, there's multiple things to think about, right? Are you technologically ready? Do you have the clean data to feed into a system like, like Adaptex? The next question would be, do you have stakeholder engagement? This is a multidisciplinary team, team approach, right? You're going to need people from IT. You're going to need some technical people from infrastructure. You're going to need clinicians, at least one. You're going to need one clinician who's willing to take a look at their data and make a change. So you've got to put, pull all that together. The question on, you know, how long does a project like this take? Well, if you've got the data feeds ready, the Adaptex team also work in a very agile way. You know, within 60 to 90 days, you can start looking at your data with a single singular type of use case modules within the system. So it can be relatively quick. But if you're one of those um, health IT shops that haven't really started their analytics journey at all and only just have a EMR, then, you know, you've got more work to do to prep before you get to this particular spot. Uh, so those would be some of the definite takeaways. Of course, you always need executive level sponsorship. So you're going to need someone in your organization. Sometimes it can be somebody like me, chief information officer, chief digital officer, possibly chief data officer in parallel with either your chief surgeon or your chief medical officer as well, trying to get, take a, a use case. So we started in the OR as the use cases. So we had the chief surgeon on board uh, as part of this. And of course, you know, it's great when we have access to uh, folks like Dr. Lowe, who not only is behind some of this technology, but also super keen to make change. Uh, and that also helps. So you've got to find those sort of nuggets as you're moving forward to the project. So it, it's not just, you know, I go back to, it's not just buy a tool and implement it. You've got to have the people, you've got to have the process to make it happen. So those would certainly be my takeaways, things we've learned as part of this journey. Great, thank you. Yeah, there's a, a couple of pragmatic questions I think are good ones um, that I'll tee up for the two of you and you decide who can respond to it. Uh, first one was related to how do you ensure that you do not overcompensate and change processes for outliers that may be related to health equity? Um, I could take that one. Um, I, 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 I assume that is going back to um, the slide I shared, uh, just like three slides, uh, four slides back. Let me just get to that. So I think it was, uh, th there was two questions related to this. And uh, the first, someone said, um, how do we ensure that, uh, that there actually is a process disparity? Uh, well, um, what I didn't show you is if I click on, so here, um, and Christina asked me to reiterate, yes, uh, this yellow line is black patients who receive Zofran, that's the prophylactic drugs. This is white patients who proceed, who receive Zofran, and there's a you know 77% versus 90%. So there's a there's absolutely a disparity of who's getting the drug. And uh, now now that disparity is gone. So um, and then back to the question from the uh, who asked how do who, how do I know? I can click this button. It will surface me the the 50 black patients that had surgery, and I can actually see. Uh, the MRN numbers, I can do a reverse audit and look at that. I can open the charts one at a time if I wanted to, but it'll tell me exactly who is in that data point. So this is kind of like the next level of analytics. It's not just giving you a graph and saying, please believe the numbers. I mean, how many of us have been there? It allows you to click a point and say, 
who was the, who were those five patients? Who were those 26 patients who experienced this? Who was the four patients that experienced this? Show me. And the system allows you to do that. Great. Awesome. Um, the second question was uh, about the OR. Does Seattle Silver use the data to manage walk time? If so how has this been received by surgeons? Good, good question. I don't think I've ever asked you that, Doctor. Uh, yeah. So, um, so block time. There, there's a whole industry about block time optimization, and and yes, adaptives can help with that. The way I think about it, I think about block time. Uh, having worked in the OR for 25 years, imagine, and for those who don't work in the OR, maybe this analogy will help you land. So imagine um, you're an Amazon dispatch center, and we, we are partners of Amazon. So, and you want every single truck to leave full. That's what block time optimization. Please put the maximum number of boxes in each truck. That's not what we're doing here. We are making the boxes smaller by making the team work more, helping them work more efficiently. And we're making of the contents of the boxes better. And those two things go hand in hand. If you make the outcomes better, the recovery times are faster, in which case the boxes in my analogy get smaller. So it's not just about packing the most number of boxes. It's make the boxes different. You have to change how you care for patients, not just the structure around it, but what drug are you giving or not giving? How are you caring for these differently? Are you iterating on the protocols to deliver the changes that you want to see? Uh, you know, are your protocols making your care better? Are they making them worse? So, uh, so that's how I think about block utilization and you know block optimization. Uh, it, we're, we're, yes, we do, and yes, we can. I think it would be the, the easiest answer for that. Great. Yeah. Another question. Jump in and oh, say, oh. you know, it, it's quite eye-opening when you are looking at multiple docs in the same specialty doing the same procedure, right? So I don't know what the next person is doing till I actually see it, right? So I think, you know, Dan showed a slide here with Dr. A, B, C, D, right? The reality is, how do you know? And then when you know, the, the interesting thing about that physicians in general is they're always competitive, right? So the question is, is now if I'm doing a surgery and it's taking 23 minutes and everybody else is doing it in 12, I don't necessarily want to be that outlier. So you then start asking that question, what, what am I doing differently than the next person? And so not only is this a tool to give you guidance as to how things are happening and how you're allocating a lot of time, but you're also looking at how people can learn from each other, right? Continuous improvement, right? Yes. It's mm -hmm. so important. And of course, every physician in, in the same specialty may be trained in 15 different ways in 15 different hospitals across mm -hmm. the world. How do you get them to sort of see eye to eye and then learn from each other? And that also is in the benefit of the patient as well as the health system. So, you know, I'd want to point that out as well. Yeah, and, and that dovetails very nice to the question from Jay Kumar, who just asked, you know, what are the, some, of the, some of the specific things, and he's asking about the urology. So the, the, here's two urologists who can do that surgery prep time in what appears to be 30% less time. Uh, what it came down to was very specific behaviors after the chief interviewed them. Number one, they never left the operating room between cases. They, once they finished interviewing that or um, uh, talking to the family that they just operated, they came straight back. Some of the other surgeons would actually go and sit in a different room and check email and do and do other things. The two surgeons who insisted on never leaving the room, that made a difference. They often had a surgical assistant, usually a resident or a fellow or sometimes a nurse practitioner. They insisted that that, it, that second operator was in the room with them, already scrubbed with their gloves on as the patient came in. So that, that shaves another one minute, half a minute. Um, they changed how they prep the solution. So you can use chlorhexidine, you can use iodine, both are compatible. One has to have a dry time, one doesn't. So there, it, it was a combination of lots, just like with continuous improvement. Things that don't seem like a big deal, uh, one minute here or there, 30 seconds here or there, they add up. And when you start doing that at scale and you start you know, seeing that at scale, they add up to big changes for an individual, but more importantly, they add up to big changes as a group. And that's where you get your, it's the little steps that let you take the big step. So sweat the little stuff uh, of how you're delivering care and what you're doing. Great. One, one last question, it's really important. 
that is how do you how do you use uh, adaptive techniques from processes in the nursing world? Uh, any examples of how you've used it? Sorry, what, what was the question again, Mike? So. Uh, the question is, how have we used the adaptive techniques to improve processes in the nursing world? Maybe you could speak a little bit to the, to the nursing team we have at Adaptics and then um, what some of the things that they've done. Sure. Um, and so when we were able to surface data, so the two examples I showed you were kind of physician centric. And yes, the nursing world is absolutely critical. So you to make uh, any place, the OR is actually a three legged stool. You need the surgeons to uh, be one leg that is getting better. You want the anesthesia team to be one leg and you absolutely need the nursing team to be uh, the, th the, th the third leg of the stool. And when you have all three together, so the examples I showed you were a little physician centric. The nurses have been doing exactly the same work, right? So if you think about a surgical journey, it starts and finishes and the middle has nurses all the way through the pre-op, during the surgery, but also after. And if you think of it as an integrated system, if there's a blockage at the recovery end, which is staffed you know, by nurses, if there's a blockage there, then that's gonna cause an upstream effect. So being able to understand, hey, in your hospital, if you take you know, an, an, a knee arthroscopy, does it matter which nurse recovers them? Is it a 60 minute recovery time, a 90 or 150 minute? It, it, and there is, I guarantee you, up to a two or three X variation in something as simple as something you do every day in terms of recovery time. Well, if you can surface that variation between the nursing staff, you can now identify the experts in those staff. And then you can say, okay, well, the expert should be coaching the new staff, right? Don't have the non-expert be the preceptor for the new staff that'll teach them bad habits. Have the best people teach the new staff. That's how you build the culture. And then the second thing is have your people be the preceptor and teach the existing staff and coach them how to improve. It's the same model. Um, physicians can do this, nurses can do this, surgical technologists can do this. Any clinician is capable of doing this. And we want to, right? That's why we came into healthcare. We want to do, everyone believes they're doing the best possible work. The data is just a big flashlight and it shines and exposes all that variation. Where's my opportunity? How do I improve? How do I improve? How, and then how does our team improve? And then how does that knock onto the system? Yeah. Yeah, I think Dan made such a great point about the three-legged stool of the, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and nursing. You know, one of the case studies that I had looked at is you can literally, in some of the graphs that Dan showed where it'll show a physician's name, you can actually drill down into that and identify, you know, who is the anesthesiologist, who's the surgeon, and who the nurse is. And many examples of where that nurse then became the kind of train the trainer to get to that optimum performance and then was there to continue to coach. Uh, and so I think it really is a big talent management tool to get these kinds of efficiencies. I know we're at the top of the hour, um, so I appreciate um, everybody's uh, internet listening. But it's a great job of our two doctors and two Dan just offered did. And um, you know, as you go forward, uh, building a strategic plan and refine your strategic plan your organization, you know, keep in mind the art of the possible um, that exists here with the work that's been done at Seattle Children's and Adaptics, because it really is a true tool I've never seen, at least in my 30 plus years in healthcare, that can really fit every one of the key pillars of the strategic plan uh, and drive value in every one of those uh, components, from you know, quality to cost to diversity, to the environment. So again, thank you for your time and um, have a great rest of the day and week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.